Okay, today we will discuss uh, central limit theorem. Okay, so with today we will be done with uh, your. Today is the last lecture as far as your syllabus is concerned. Again, the central limit theorem is not one theorem, it is a family of theorems of which we will do the most simple version for IID random variables. Just like law of large numbers is also valid for uh, more general under more general assumptions of some weak correlations and so on, right. But we will do a central limit theorem only for IID random variables, okay. So, the central limit theorem, I say at a very high level, the central limit theorem uh, establishes the importance of the Gaussian distribution all right. Uh, so, we know already that if you were to add any number of independent Gaussian random variables, you will get another Gaussian random variable right that is something we have already established right. So, as long as, as, long as they are independent if you keep adding independent Gaussians you get another Gaussian right. Uh, so, this is so this is one this is another way of saying this is that the Gaussian distribution is stable. So, so if, you, if you keep adding Gaussians, you will get another Gaussian. Similarly, you know the Cauchy distribution is stable. You keep adding Cauchy random variables, you get another Cauchy random variable, right. So, um, in the, so, the central limit theorem goes ahead and says a little more about the Gaussian. Uh, particularly, if you have a finite variance random variables, okay. Uh, if you keep adding a large number of finite variance random variables whose mean is 0, let us say. 0 mean finite variance random variables. Uh, the sum looks like a Gaussian even if the original distribution is not a Gaussian, it can be anything with finite variance. Okay. So, that is roughly what the central limit theorem says. All right. So, your x i's, so if you are adding a number of x i's which are let us say independent and identically distributed, the, the distribution of x i's could be anything, okay, but with finite variance. Okay. But the result of adding these independent uh, identically distributed random variables looks more and more like a Gaussian when you add more and more terms. Okay. So, this property is called, so this establishes, the central limit theorem establishes the Gaussian as an attracting distribution, not just a stable distribution, but an attracting distribution among finite variance random variables. Okay. So, Gaussian is not just stable, we already know it is a stable distribution because if you keep adding Gaussians, you get a Gaussian. Now, we are saying that even if you are not adding Gaussians, as long as you add enough of them, finite variance random variables, you will get something that looks like a Gaussian, which means it is also an attractor in this world of finite variance random variables. Okay. So, that is at, at a high level. So, one way to look at it is you know that so S n so X i's are I i d let us say. So, with mean expectation of X and uh, variance sigma squared let us say okay, or sigma x squared. Then you know S n we defined as i equals 1 through n x i. So, some, so, from the law of large numbers, we know that S n over n goes to expectation of x, right. Let us say in probability, right. Weak law says in probability, strong law says this is almost sure, right. So, another way of saying this is that if you take S n which is the sum of the first n i i d random variables and you subtract n times the mean right, 
divided by n you get something that goes to 0 in probability or almost surely right that is so that you will admit right. So, this is because of law of large numbers right I am just bringing this to this side ok. So, now so if you look at this so if you look at this term right. So, this is S n minus n times the expected value right this guy. So, this result is saying that this difference is sublinear in n right as n becomes large. So, this ratio goes to 0 which means that fluctuation right S n minus n times the mean that that fluctuation from n times the mean is sublinear in n right that much is clear from the law of large numbers agreed. Now, the central limit theorem gives a finer characterization of this fluctuation ok. In particular it says that not only is this difference from S n minus not only is this numerator is the difference sublinear in n it further says that this difference is approximately like square root of n ok if you have a finite variance all right. So, this is approximately like square root of n all right that is one of the things that CLT says even more remarkably what it says is that so, this is like square root of n. So, if you were to have a square root of n in a denominator you will have something that is like order 1 right because this is like square root of n. So, if you divide the numerator by not by n, but by square root of n you should have something that is like order n order 1 right. Now, that order 1 term is a Gaussian fluctuation that is what it says ok is a norm n 0 1 fluctuation ok. So, I will just put that down. So, what what the CLT says is in very loose terms CLT says that S n minus n times expectation of x is about as big as square root of n. So, this is obviously a very precise, uh, imprecise statement, but we are saying this is roughly a square root of n fluctuation for large n ok. And B says that the distribution of S n minus n expectation of x divided by square root of n approaches the Uh, approaches ok. So, approaches the Gaussian distribution n 0 sigma square irrespective of the irrespective of the distribution of the x i's ok. So, it it says two things as I said. So, this n s n minus n times square root n times expectation of x is approximately like square root of n. So, the sublinearity which we which we uh, get from this law of large numbers it is further qualified that this is not just sublinear it is actually square root of n roughly for large n. And if you take s n minus n expectation of x divided by square root of n. So, that order 1 term you get is still a random variable right because this guys are random variables. So, that order 1 term 
you get by dividing by square root of n looks statistically looks like a Gaussian random variable. It, it in fact approaches the Gaussian distribution as n becomes large okay. and this is true irrespective of the distribution of xi's. All we need from xi's is that it must have finite variance okay. Any, any finite variance distribution is okay, anything you think of. So, things like Cauchy are not included because Cauchy does not have finite variance, it does not even have a mean, right. So, uh, as long as you have finite variance, this will definitely attract to a Gaussian, okay. Is this clear? So, this is the IID version for the IID version of the CLT, right. It, it also holds under slightly, I mean there are some more general versions of CLT where you do not necessarily demand IID, right. You can relax, you can have some uh, decaying correlations or XIs can be differently distributed, but no one of them should dominate very strongly. In those circumstances, you can get a CLT, but we will only bother about this IID version, okay. Theorem. Then so okay, un equal to blah 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 converges in distribution to a standard Gaussian random variable. Okay, that is the central limit. This is the precise statement. So you have IID random variables with mean mu and variance sigma squared, and you have to assume that sigma squared is finite. Okay, if sigma squared is finite, then this uh, this object S n minus n mu over square root of n, right. I put the sigma down to get a standard Gaussian, right. Otherwise, you will get a Gaussian with variance sigma squared, okay. So, I put this sigma down here in order to get a standard Gaussian limit, okay. So, then this sequence of random variables, let us call this u n. So, these u n's are centered by taking away the mean and scaled by sigma times square root of n. Right. So, you have made u n into a 0 mean a unit variance sequence, right. So, we are saying that this sequence of random variables converges in distribution to a standard Gaussian n 0 1, okay. That is f. So, what is convergence in distribution? f u n of x when I am looking at the CDF, f u 1 of x converges to, so limit n tending to infinity of the CDF must be equal to what? Error function of x, right, error function or q, what did I use? ERF, ERF is what I used, right. So, this is 
what is this? Set of function is integral minus infinity to x 1 over square root of 2 pi e power minus uh, uh, y square or something y square over 2 dy. Okay. So, it says that the limit if you take the CDF of this sequence right, if u n is a sequence of random variables whose CDF sequence of CDF converges to the CDF of the standard Gaussian. Okay. So, that is what the central limit theorem says. What the central limit theorem does not say is that the u n will have a PDF converging to the bell curve it does not say that okay. that is a very big misconception. See what I mean. So, if you take these random variables u n, right, first of all, these u n's need not have a density, right, because we have not assumed that these x i's have density, they need not be continuous, they can be whatever you want, right. Any finite variance distribution will do, right. So, these x n's or these u n need not have a density, right. So, in any case, you do not, even if they have a density, it is not necessarily the case that you will have convergence of at least the central limit theorem does not say that u1 will have a density that looks like the bell curve that is not what the theorem says okay this is a very big misconception it only says convergence of cdfs not pdfs in fact the pdf may not exist okay the convergence is to the error function the cdf goes to the error function it's not true that you approach a bell curve or u n u n may not have a density and it need not have a density that goes to the bell curve okay is that clear any questions on the statement So, uh, this error this, so this is a continuous limit right. So, you do not have to have the problem of uh, the convergence and distribution you have the problem that you only need convergence at points of continuity right that problem does not arise here because this is such a nice function it is a continuous function right. Any questions? Okay, proof. Proof is actually very simple in the IID case. So, you let z i equal to. So, I am just going to center these guys. I am going to center and scale the x i's. Okay. So, I am going to just going to take the mean away and scale by the standard deviation. So, I get these z i's will be uh, 0 mean and unit variance. Okay. But these z i's need not be Gaussian. Z i's are just the scaled version of x i's, right? They can be anything. They just have zero mean and unit variance. And then you have u n. U n will be equal to uh, sum over z i divided by square root of n, right? Great. So, let me consider C Z C Z i of T. Okay. These so these random variables Z i have zero mean and uh, unit variance. Therefore, the characteristic function must admit a Taylor expansion up to second order, right? So it must. So this guy must look like what? So you have a one plus i times zero t, right? Zero mean zero is the mean, isn't it? So i plus i times zero times t, then plus i squared so minus 1 times expectation of x squared right the second moment which is now equal to 1 times t squared over 2 factorial right. 
plus there will be a little o term, little o term of t squared, is not it? Fine. Little o t squared, okay. Not big O, little o, little o t squared. Okay, good. Now, so I want to eventually, so I, this is what I want, right? I want the characteristic function of C u n t. What I will eventually show is that C u n t as n tends to infinity converges to the Gaussian, Gaussian characteristic function, which we know is e, e power minus t squared over 2, right? So, I, so it is happy that I have a term like that now, right? So, I am going to uh, try to calculate the central limit, so the sorry, the, uh, the characteristic function of u n. So, C u n of t. So now you have to help me. So this, so this is a. Okay, this is square root of n here. But other than that, this is just the nth power of c z i, right? So if you, if this is what this wasn't there, the characteristic function of the sum alone will be the nth power of the characteristic function of z i because they are i i d, correct? So I think what so what turns up is that c u n t will be c z i of t over square root n to the nth. Okay. I think this is what will come up because there is a square root of n in the bottom. Okay. I think this is fairly easy to verify. So, this will be equal to 1 minus t squared over 2 plus little o well okay 2 t n power n correct so i have to write so i am taking the nth power of c z i of t over square root of n so wherever i have t i write t over square root of n right so i get t square over 2 n plus little o t square over n fine straightforward so now this converges to so this is so as n becomes large so this is 2n okay so as n becomes large this is little o t square over n right so this will go to zero very quickly okay so and therefore we will not play a role in the limit as n tends to infinity this will just go to e power minus t square over 2 right so this goes to power minus t square over 2 for all t as n tends to infinity. Thus, u n converges in distribution. This is the characteristic function of a standard Gaussian, right? Right, so it's it's a very short proof if you look at it, right? So we've used characteristic function convergence to establish a very fundamental result in just three steps. Okay, and this is a perfectly I mean this is a perfectly rigorous proof. Okay, there I have not cut any corners here, right? So the only thing you have to be slightly careful about is you have to show that this doesn't matter. You have to be a little careful in showing that. That's all. Okay. So this is a this is a perfectly correct rigorous proof. Uh, there are many see the many elementary textbooks on prob probability give many uh, pseudo proofs. You know they try to manipulate the density and try to get e power minus x square by two for their density. Right? Those proofs are not correct because there is no proof. There is the convergence is not in the density. The convergence is in the characteristic function. Therefore, the convergence is in distribution. Okay. So it's not uh, at best these manipulations found in more elementary textbooks they can serve as some intuition serve to provide some intuition but it's not a correct proof to use those elementary proofs okay this is the simplest and 
the most complete proof is a complete proof of central limit theorem for the IID case. Any questions? So, these xi's can even be discrete or some mixtures or whatever you want as long as there is a finite uh, as long as there is a finite variance <coughs> convergence in distribution is guaranteed. So, if xi's were let us say discrete or something suppose xi's were discrete then this u n's will also take only countable set of values correct. So, you cannot possibly have convergence of this u n will not even have a density in that case right and because u n will also be discrete if x i's are discrete uh, the c d f of u n will have discontinuities the, unit, the c d f will have jumps right, but in the limit these jumps become smaller and smaller and you and you will converge to the error function ok. So, the limiting c d f although the c d f of f u n of x may have a number of discontinuities because u n as x n's may be discrete u n's may be therefore, discrete, but if you take the limiting c d f you get a nice error function ok. Is that clear? So, the error function looks like that right, but the limiting functions may have these little little jumps which gradually become finer and finer and converge to the error function, but the sequence u n may still be discrete or mixtures or singular or whatever you what have you right. Generally, even if you have densities, so even if you have a sequence of random variables with densities which converge in distribution, it is not necessarily the case that the sequence of densities converges ok. There is a there are some counter examples for this I, I believe you, there is one in the homework did you put that in the homework uh, yeah. So, there are there are so I think Grimmett has a counter example for this. So, you may have a situation where x n converges to x n distribution and x n's are all continuous random variables. So, they have densities, but still you may have a situation where the densities of x n's do not converge to the density of x ok that is also possible. So, it is not true that even if you have these u n's may have density, but still fail to converge to the bell curve that it is not it is not a consequence of central limit theorem. So, ok so th that is not what C L T says it says convergence of C D F's ok. It is not a failure of radon Nicodem theorem, it is they both have uh, densities, it is just that the sequence of densities do not converge to what you want. Sequence of C D F converges, see generally speaking if you have f, f of f, f, f n of x converging to f of x it does not mean that f n dash of x converges to f dash of x correct, the sequence of derivatives need not converge correct. You need additional you need if you have uniform convergence you can assert the convergence of densities right. So, you need additional assumptions and if you want to assert the convergence of densities you need additional assumptions ok. So, the such such results actually such a result does exist for example, there is something called local local central limit theorem. So, an example is so this is just for your information this is not something you have to really learn. Uh, very seriously local central limit theorem actually Grimmett has a version of this local CLT. So, Grimmett and Sturzek uh, let x 1 x 2 dot 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 be an i i d sequence of random variables with 0 mean and unit variance.
suppose c x of t the characteristic function of these x i's satisfies so the let us say it is the characteristic function satisfies so d uh, d d t ok. So, the rth moment is integrable for some <coughs> integer r bigger than or equal to 1. Then u n has a density by me I mean p d f ok. U n has a density function uh, say f u n for n greater than or equal to this r. And further, f u n of x converges to e power minus x square over 2 over square root of 2 pi as n tends to infinity uniformly. for all x in r. So, this is uh, the proof is actually Grimmett gives a full proof of this. So, this is one example of a local central limit theorem. So, this is not this uh, this requires an additional assumption that for example, for so, so for r greater than or equal to 1 for some r greater than or equal to 1 integer valued r greater than or equal to 1 you have that the characteristic function rth moment is integrable. Right for r equal to 1 this is absolute integrability of c x right if you just take r equal to 1 for the sake of simplicity this is saying that c x is absolutely integrable ok. So, actually if c x is absolutely integrable you know that there necessarily exists a density right we stated a theorem about it. In fact, you have a density which is uniformly continuous right. So, when you have a density that is uniformly continuous then you can prove that the convergence actually happens to the density of the Gaussian ok. And if generally r is r does not have to be 1 r can be 2 or 3 ok it can be square integrable or cubed integrable ok. And for n greater than or equal to r your u n will have a density ok. that is an example of a local local central limit theorem. So, you need more assumptions in, in order to get convergence of densities even if you have continuous random variables ok. Are there any questions? So, the central limit theorem is the physical reason behind uh, the common occurrence of the Gaussian random variable in so many engineering and statistics applications right. So, if you were to if you were to measure the noise across a wire which does not carry any current uh, you will get a it, it is distributed like a Gaussian right it is Gaussian distributed noise the thermal noise across a resistor is the Gaussian noise right this is something that people often say. So, the so the underlying reason behind this is in fact the central limit theorem right because if you have this piece of wire. Uh, so, this go this thermal noise is a thermodynamic statistical thermodynamic phenomenon right. So, you have a number of these electrons 
and there is no electric field right you just have a wire there is no electric field so there is no current. So, these electro electrons are just jiggling around due to their uh, due to their thermal energy right then there is no mean there is just uh, variance right they have this thermal uh, disturbances and you have so many of them right uh, moving around uh, because of their thermal variance and each electron creates ever so small a voltage because of its of this vibration these movements right and you have so many of these electrons. So, on the sum looks like a so the net voltage looks like a Gaussian because of the central limit theorem. So, you have a 0 mean and some finite variance finite variance is because this is a thermodynamic uh, system right. So, the finite energy system which is why in all these thermodynamic finite energy finite variance systems you have this Gaussian everywhere right and the variance of this electrons jumping around is related to the temperature larger the temperature more they will jump around. So, more the thermal noise ok the more the variance of this noise ok. So, the central limit theorem is the is at the heart of these things ok. Any questions on the central limit theorem? Okay, so that completes central limit theorem. If you don't have any more questions, we, uh, that's the end of central limit theorem. Actually, there is uh, there is another theorem which is more advanced which further qualifies this uh, fluctuation S n minus n mu over square root of n ok. Uh, I will just because I have some 10 15 minutes left I will just put the theorem down ok. It is uh, it is certainly not in your syllabus uh, it is called the law of iterated logarithms. law of iterated logarithm. So, it is a it is a pretty long it is a pretty long hard theorem to prove ok it is a fairly advanced theorem, but it is a fairly remarkable result ok. So, Grimmett and Sturzaker uh, section 7.6. So, you have let us say that let us say x i is r i i d 0 mean unit variance ok and let u n is equal to let u n equal to s n over square root of n right. So, you are essentially summing the 0 mean random variables dividing by square root of n <coughs> So, this so central limit theorem says this fluctuation is as n tends to infinity this fluctuation is roughly like a Gaussian n 0 1 random variable right. Now, this law of iterated logarithm looks at the largest value taken by this un ok. How big are these? So, as n becomes large you know that if you fix any particular n very large n this un is going to look like a Gaussian right, but if you look at a very large n and look at. So, suppose I am at a very large n n equal to a million let us say and I am looking at the sequence that is coming after a million after a very large n. If you look at that entire sequence what is the largest value it takes? How big are these fluctuations at maximum? Understand what I mean? So, this fluctuation, so you have these fluctuations right. So, let, let me plot, let me say pretend that I am plotting n and u n right. So, we, so for each n you will have some fluctuations right and if you just fix an n fix a particular n and run various omegas you will get this Gaussian for 
for that u n distribution because of central limit theorem. But the law of iterated logarithm does not fix a particular n and look at its distribution which is what CLT does. It looks at the largest value taken beyond n right is there a very big fluctuation somewhere and how big is that fluctuation okay is what it looks at okay. So, the remarkable result is that the largest fluctuation in some sense the limb soup of this u n is roughly like log log n okay that is why it is called the law of iterated logarithm you have log of log of n right. So, the biggest value for large n the biggest value that this fluctuation takes although for a particular n it is Gaussian if you look at the entire play of this entire realization of this fluctuations the largest value it is going to take is like square root of log log n okay. So, in particular the theorem is this the theorem under these assumptions is that limb soup of this guy S n over square root of n log log n So, this is equal to square root of 2 almost surely ok. This is the law of literator iterator log logarithms it is a pretty remarkable result. So, we are saying S n over square root of n is Gaussian, but the limb soup the largest variation looking beyond n right. So, so the largest variation as limit n 10 to infinity if you scale it down by square root of log log n is almost surely equal to square root of 2. Okay. So, which means that uh, so, which means that this ratio will exceed square root of 2 will ok. So, if for any value of c which is less than square root of 2 this ratio will exceed c infinitely often, but if this value c is greater than square root of 2 such uh, the excursion beyond c will be only finitely often ok. So, this is a I mean this is just for your just I, I put this down because there was some time left ok. This proving this is quite hard where it is a fairly non trivial result ok. So, the it is the limb soup goes like square root of n log log n ok that is what this iterated logarithm says ok I will stop here the lecture is over.